Thanks for your word working, O oh God. We thank you that heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word will not pass away. And we thank you, Father God, that as you let your word reign in our lives, we will see the manifestation of Christ in our midst. We will see the manifestation of Christ in our lives. And we will see the manifestation, O oh God, of your glory. That you are reserved for these last days. We give you praise, honor, and glory, Father God. And as we are gathered together this morning, and you cross every one of our hearts and our minds and our conscience to know the power of the blood of Jesus. And on any minds that have not had the blood applied, we apply the blood. We thank you, Father, for the blood that sprinkles our conscience, for the blood that is applied to our spirit, souls, and bodies, for the blood that is in this place where we stand in the blood. We thank you, Father God, for the power of your blood. Let us know, Father. Open our eyes to know the power of your blood, the power of your word, the power of your spirit, and the power of the name of Jesus, that we may know to the fullness and experience all that you want us to experience. Cause every heart and mind to be attentive to your word and release your grace into our midst as we look into your word, we worship you and adore you in the revelation of your word. Conclude for us, Father, all the teaching on grace in a way and a manner that you want to. And Holy Spirit of truth, we give you the rightful place to bring an inward and a personal revelation of truth to every heart and every mind right now. Thank you, Father. And most of all, we covenant to give you all the worship, all the honor for everything that is done. We give you all the glory. Bring all the praises and thanksgiving of the people straight towards your throne and place it there. For you are the source and the finisher. To you belong our glory, and we give it all to you, in Jesus' name, Amen. Let's give Jesus a good clap offering, praise God. This morning is a very important session to open your hearts and minds to the Word of God. We conclude the series that we have done on grace and uh, we pray God that we are able to impart all those truths that were set us free as we consider grace in the word of God. Let's look at the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter five. The last part of verse five, where the quotation is. Well, let's read the whole thing. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Notice how humility is a clothing that we wear. Be clothed with humility. Humility is not just an attitude, it is a clothing. Be clothed with humility, for God receives the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, 
that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. One more passage, James, epistle of James, just before Peter, chapter 4. Verse 6 and verse 7. But he gives more grace. See, grace can be received in great measure. He gives more grace. Grace is a substance we receive from God through the impartation of God's hand upon it. He gives more grace. How to receive more grace? Therefore, he says, God receives Keep the proud, but give grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. And the purpose of submitting to God means to yield unto God, to come before God's throne of grace and receive grace. Submit to God, receive the devil, and he will flee from you. God gives grace to the humble. Say this after me. God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. I receive the grace of God by humbling myself before God. We see how humility and grace go together. We see last week how that, according to Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 4, that the power of God is in His hand. When people come to the front, we have hands laid on them. You know where we got that from? From God. God is the one who lay hands laid. All this is from the Father. We are just imitating the Father. Where do we get laying on our hands to impart? From God. Not only God's method, God himself does it. God puts his hand on his people. God's hands come on, upon his people and impart an impartation. When we humble ourselves before God, God put his hands upon us and we draw grace from him. However, our coming to God must be a certain attitude. Not everybody who comes forward receives unless your heart is right. Your attitude is right. You can go to the same meeting and not receive the same thing. It all has to do with the attitude of our heart. Humility in our life. So it's not only important to know how to receive grace from God. It's important to know how to approach Him in humbleness. How to approach Him in humility. And humility is something which which people do not understand very much. They don't understand what being humble means. Being humble, there are two extremes that people understand when we say the word humble. On one extreme is where we we understood that uh, being humble means to let people run you over and... uh, uh, everything that happens to you, you just get run over. Devil comes, you just let him run over you. And everything comes, you just let it run over you. Circumstances come, you just let it run over you. Demons trouble you, you just let it run over you. Everything that comes, you just humble. You call it humble. And you humble yourself, and the steamroller comes and run over you. You're not a Christian, you're a doorman. Run over you, run over you. So that's one attitude that people have on humility. Humility means don't do anything, very passive. Passive, that's all, that's all you do. That's be, that means being humble. Just one little thought on qualification here. Humility is not something that is involuntary. It's voluntary. When something happens to you and you have no choice, you've got no choice but to be humble. 
Some of us have no choice in some circumstances but to be humble. You're not humble, we lose our job. You're not humble, something to happen. So we are forced by circumstances to be humble. That is not the humility God talks about. That is a humility that is false, that is outward, that is forced upon us by circumstances. We see now sometimes people uh, under certain circumstances are forced to humble themselves. But that is not the humility God talks about. One fine day, when we all get to the glory at the judgment throne of God, the devil, remember, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, of things on earth and underneath the earth. One fine day, the devil himself, is very stubborn now, will have to bow down his knee. The Bible says all before Jesus and confess defeat. Total defeat before our Lord Jesus. He cannot get saved. I mean, we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about him bowing before Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess Jesus is Lord. Now that is not humility because it's being forced upon. If there's circumstances in your life that force you to be humble, and you, you are broken under the circumstances, that is not humility. That is not the humble that the Bible talks about. To understand humility, we have to study the man who is full, who is full of humility, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. What he means by being humble, what he means by humility. And there's no point in the life of Jesus that could give us a greater exhibition of this attribute called humility. To be humble before God than when he was on trial and when he was going to the cross. Jesus Christ did not go to the cross without any power. Jesus Christ had all the power and sometimes when I read the Gospels, especially when I'm meditating very deeply, I was just recently reading the Gospel of John. I came across a part where Jesus was on a trial and uh, the high priest was trying him in the night time. Remember they caught him in the night time and brought him to the house of Caiaphas? So in the home of Caiaphas, they are having a pre-trial, which is illegal in the Jewish law. But these fellows don't, don't follow Jewish law. They only follow the laws that help them, or that benefit them. They don't follow all. Those that uh, help them to be selfish, they follow. So there they were in Caiaphas' house. And there's one part that, I mean, literally almost broke my heart. When I meditate deeply on that, Jesus was there, and... The high priest questioned Jesus. He was questioning Jesus. And he said, Pretend, of course, all this is in pretend. They have witnesses, but witnesses did not agree. Under human court, it would never have passed through. So he was asking Jesus a question. And Jesus said this statement. He said that, I have spoken everything openly. You can ask those who hear me. In the Gospel of John, I was meditating on that. So I could see Jesus there speaking. I have spoken all things openly. You can ask those who hear me. Suddenly out of the blue, the next passage says, the next verse, says the soldier standing next to Jesus just slapped Jesus. <laughs> ah, my heart almost broke when, when I, I felt that. I, I almost felt a slap. <laughs> when you're meditating very deep, everything becomes very real. And, uh, I mean, I just cried. And then not only moves us to, to uh, empathize with Jesus in all that he went through, then not only moves us, but the most remarkable thing that Jesus went through everything. I know that some of you have seen movies, you know, the life of Jesus, and when Jesus was crucified. I sometimes, when I was a, a, a teenager, I was attending a church, and they were having a revival meeting, emergency meeting, and the preacher was picturing how Jesus was crucified. Ah, I mean, he really go into details to describe. And uh, he talked about how they pulled the hand of Jesus and uh, put it on the piece of wood there. And uh, then they took the rusty nail and they placed it right there. 
and they took a hammer. Oh, I closed my eyes. And they said, they hammered it in. And they, they just described it in great detail. And it could really jerk the tear out of you. Good thing it didn't jerk, jerk you out of your seat. But it could really jerk you, jerk the tear, tears out of you. And all these things are very moving physically. And then as I go deeper in the Lord, the Lord began to show, not only is His physical suffering terrible, remember the physical suffering of the cross is nothing special. I'm not speaking something that seems. You read the Bible carefully, there were other people who were crucified. How many of you remember that? How many crosses were, ha- were on the hill? Three. It was a common way of execution. The physical suffering of the cross was not the only redemption plan. It was a common way to execute criminals. So it was not just the physical suffering on the cross. As I progressed spiritually, God began to show me it's not just the physical suffering. Physical suffering was terrible. In fact, that was one of the terrible ways to die. It was terrible enough, but it was common. Nothing special about Jesus' physical suffering being crucified on the cross. And then the Holy Spirit began to reveal to me that Jesus suffered even more because He went through soul to veil. When He became seen on the cross, His, His soul suffered for us. His soul took our sin. His, he became sin. His spirit was separated from God. Nobody knows the spiritual suffering Jesus went through. None of us can ever experience that. No human being, that was uncommon. Nobody in the whole world has ever experienced the kind of spiritual death that Jesus experienced. So the internal agony, the internal pain, the internal suffering was so great and it started in the Garden of Gethsemane so strong that when he prayed, the, the sweat was drops of blood literally coming down. So the internal was, was so great that Jesus on the cross cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from the Father. Oh, there was terrible darkness in him. At that time, read 2 Corinthians 5.21. He became sin. He not only took our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He, he became sin as I am. Singular. And he talked about the, him being hanged there. So I began to realize that, the, that the, the spiritual suffering of Jesus the atonement. Jesus has to die for you, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. And so, if Jesus only died for your body, your body will be saved alone. If Jesus only died for your spirit, only your spirit will be saved. But praise be unto God. He died for our spirit, soul, and body. He has to redeem all three parts that make a human being. Spirit, soul, and body. So he, I understood this spiritual suffering was something I could never comprehend. Some call it the passion of Jesus. We can never comprehend. But that was not all. I thought that was all. Finally, the Holy Spirit bring me even closer. And I began to see in the Word, which is where we talk about humility, that Jesus went through all those physical spiritual and soulish suffering for us not because He did it without the power to come out of it. Ah, that really showed me what humility is. You don't understand humility? Look at the cross of Jesus. When they capture Him, Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, he says, No man takes my life from me. No man can take my life. Father, the Father has given me my life. I have power to lay my life down and to take my life up. You can check it, write it down. John 10 verse 17 and 18. He said, I have power. He was not a helpless person going to the cross. He had power. 
He had all the power of God behind him when he went to the cross. But he chose not to use it. That is humility. So when, when he allowed himself, see, if he has power over his own life, unless Jesus allowed himself to be captured, you can never capture him. Unless Jesus allowed himself to be crucified, you can never crucify him. They tried for three years, they couldn't catch him, right? Imagine there were many times when in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, he stood up and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And everybody in the synagogue was angry at him, very angry at him, because of the words he spoke. They took him to the pinnacle of a hill, to the sea place, a cliff. They want to throw him down. The Bible says he walked straight through their midst. No one dared to touch him. Because he has power to lay his eyes down, he has power to take it up again. No one can kill or crucify Jesus unless he allow it. Our Lord Jesus has power. And so, when they came and captured him in the garden of Gethsemane, Peter, one of his disciples, took the sword. He thought it was time for samurai. Maybe I've seen too much ninja, shogun, something. But he had visions of that. So then they come with sticks and lambs and swords. When they captured Jesus, Peter being that kind of person, he was hot temper. Any of you hot temper, you can change your name to Peter. And get redeemed. He was real hot temper. And what is fast? Praise God. I'm not that Peter, I'm a redeemed Peter. Most of you looking at me that way. Uh, better, better say something nice. Because I named that name. So he took the sword and he goes, and I want you to know he was not aiming for the ear. Who wants to aim for the ear? Some, sometimes you read a passage, you think that he just took the sword out and just cut the ear. Friend, he was aiming for the head. He goes, good thing the person died. So you must, you must see all this. You must imagine, you must meditate on it to see closely. Peter was aiming for his head. He wanted to slice the head off. Good thing. It was just the ear. He quickly died and the ear got cut off. The ear fell to the ground. You know what Jesus did? The prisoner. He went... Pick up the ear, stick it back. You read the Bible? He has so much power. He took the ear and stick it back. Now how many believe Jesus is a surgeon? He is. He don't even need those needles and those special threads. He just takes it and says, suck it back. I always wonder what would happen if he had been the head. If the head had ro- rolled off. Maybe Jesus will pick it up and suck it back. They all run. But the power of Jesus was so great, when Peter did that, Jesus said, put your sword away. And the next thing Jesus said, it is found in Matthew chapter 26, verse 51, 52 and 53. Jesus said, do you think that I cannot pray to the Father now and he will send me twelve legions of angels. Right then in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said that. He said, right at that time, he told Peter, what is your one little sword? Like a samurai. Jesus said, I can just ask my father, and he will send me twelve legions. A legion in that time is about six thousand. Twelve legions, friend, is seventy-two thousand angels. In the Old Testament, one angel can slay a whole army. He can have 72,000 angels. Could you imagine the whole Roman Empire cannot stand against him? All Jesus has to do is just give a little squeak. Father, boom! They would all be killed. So the most marvelous thing the Holy Spirit showed me, He brought me to the place where I not only see, when I was young, as a teenager, I saw only the physical suffering. And I thought that was it. 
Then I realized it's a common suffering. Then he brought me to show spiritual suffering, the, the soul suffering of Jesus. And I thought that was it. Then he brought me further, the Holy Spirit brought me further and showed me through it all, Jesus had the power to come out. I said, wow. What makes him so humble? God said, that is meekness and humility. The power of God was available to him. In fact, when he was on the cross, the sinners, the bad guys were crying out. They said, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. He could have chosen. But if he had chosen that, you and I would never be saved. It was not the nails that kept Jesus on the cross. It was His love for you and I. Oh, how He loves you and me. The nails couldn't hold Him. He got so much power available for Him. Nothing held Jesus to the cross but His love for you and me. He came to die for our sins. He came to redeem us. He came to set us free from sicknesses. He loved us so much. And the most marvelous revelation, when I saw it, I bowed down before God and worshipped. I couldn't stand it anymore. I said, God, you had so much power, Jesus. My Lord Jesus, you had so much power. And yet, you allow people to slap you. You allow people to pull your beard out. You allow people to beat you on the back. You allow people to crucify you. You allow people to torment you and say, come down. And yet, you know you could come down, but you choose not to. Oh God, what humility we have shown. And the Bible says in Philippians 2, that because Jesus humbled himself, he humbled himself in a form of man. He humbled himself right to the cross. God exalted him. That is what humility means. So I want you to understand humility. Humility is not... That you, you don't have the power to come out of it. That is not humility. That is not Christian suffering. Christian suffering is when you have the power not to do, not to suffer it and yet you allow it. We are talking about going through hard times just to preach the word. Who would give up their lives, go to the jungle, give up the comforts of the world. Sometimes going without food. Sometimes going without, without drink. Trusting the Lord to provide. When you have a choice, then you could come out of it anytime. See, the difference is in your ability to come out. Many people, they suffer from their circumstances and they thought that there is humility. That is not. Humility is from your heart. Nothing outwardly can withstand your choice. But from your heart. Because, Jesus said, because the Father tells me to. Because I receive a commandment from my Father. And I pray to my Father and say, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But if not, thy will be done. And not mine. The Lord Jesus has said, I give up my own will. I give up my own freedom. I give up all these things. I could use it, Father. But if there's no other way that I can win this world for you, if there's no other way I could save the lives of this dying world that do not know you, even on the cross they said, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they are doing. And our Lord Jesus said, if there is any other way, but he knew there was none, he said, let your will be done. Humility is to willfully submit yourself to what the Father commands you to, difficult or hard, even though you have the power to come out. You choose not to. You choose not to. I speak to husbands here. Some husbands are rough on their wives. Physically, God made you stronger. Husband, if you ever lay a hand on your wife, watch out. 
you may be stronger but if you learn the humility of God you learn that authority is not something you use loosely God may make you head of the family but you learn to use it in a Christ like way humility is when you have the power and you will only obey the father if he doesn't tell me I won't do it if he tells me I will do it if he tells me to go through something allow people to do that alright that's it think about the humility of our Lord Jesus that's being humble now we also have a man a man of God in the Bible who exemplified the humility of Jesus one of the greatest apostles of all time the Apostle Paul he wrote one third of the New Testament God used him mightily because he humbled himself mightily I want you to look at some of the sufferings we go through so they can identify and understand humility to receive grace to receive grace you must understand humility you come before God God tells you to go do something that's it you go through it without speaking anything you go through it silent like a lamb led to the shearer you understand Christian suffering. There is a Christian suffering. It's not suffering those things Jesus has redeemed us from. But it's suffering persecution. It's suffering misunderstanding. It's suffering when you do something in God that the Father tells you to. The man will not understand. But yet in your heart is bubbling with love. Nothing but love coming out. And you willingly go through without speaking or repaying evil for evil you repay evil with good turn with me to the Bible in the book of Corinthians Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8 the apostle Paul says for we do not want you to be ignorant brethren of our trouble which came to us in Asia we were burdened burdened beyond measure above strength think about the pressure they go through in life just to preach the gospel just to bring souls to Jesus just to love people and bring the gospel to them just to see people set free by the love of Jesus Christ Paul says we were burdened beyond measure above strength we despaired even of life there were times Paul said that he, he was almost dying and he tells us yes we had a sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the day who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many verse 12 for our boasting indeed is this the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom but by the everybody say that word grace by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you Paul says I live by grace remember grace will help you in areas where you cannot enable Paul says he despaired of life he had no strength left but grace came and strengthened him Grace was imparted so that he could do the things of God. Grace is given to those who are humble. Paul went through all these things out of his free choice. He could have come out of it, but he willingly go through it. He humbled himself. And God gives grace. Because he humbled himself. A, a longer listing of what he went through is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says in verse 22 the reason he said this was because he was an apostle and there were false apostles who were claiming, claiming to be apostles claiming to be better than Paul Paul got really stirred up in all this he really got stirred up 
And so he replied and said, Are they Hebrews? These people who claim to be apostles, who are false apostles, they are they Hebrews? So am I. In the natural, they have nothing better, Paul says. In the natural, he was equal to them. So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they the ministers of Christ? He was saying, I am too. But the only difference, they have not humbled themselves, they have not known the sufferings of Jesus. See the difference? See, they claim they are Hebrews, they claim they are Israelites. But they do not know that the grace of God, remember grace is ministerial grace too. We have touched on that last week. The grace as of an apostle, the grace of a prophet, the grace of an evangelist, the grace of a pastor, the grace of a teacher, the grace of the body ministry, the gift of God given in your life. It's all the grace imparted to you. Paul says they claim all these things by themselves. And actually Paul says, if you want to talk natural, Paul says, I'm equal to them. They're Hebrews, I'm an extra Hebrew. They're Israelite, so am I. But there's only one point that they could not surpass for. In the willingness to humble himself for the gospel's sake. Paul says these are his qualifications. They could not qualify. You see, Paul lists his qualification. He didn't put his graduate of the Jerusalem Seminary. He didn't put that he was the doctor of divinity of the Bethesda Pool Cemetery. He did not say all this. He said, these are my qualifications. These are my qualifications. He says, I speak as a fool. You know, when people argue in the natural, it's all fool. In the, in the, in the area. It's all foolishness because the things of the natural pass away. Paul says, I am more in labor, more abundant. Paul says, I have more threats than them. They have what? One, two, copra. Some of them got one, two, three, sergeant. Some of them one, blank corporal. Paul said, look behind me. Countless strikes on his physical body. Paul says, in strikes above measure. In prisons more frequently. Paul was a very famous criminal. I mean, he was in prison. In prison more often than any one of them. Any of you are the start prison ministry? In death, often. That means many times he came close to death. Perhaps some of the time he died and God sent him back. One possibility is uh, when he was in, uh, in the book of Acts chapter 16. I mean, they dragged him, they stoned him, they left him for dead and he woke up again when the disciples around him. We do not understand that situation. A possibility he was so close to death or his spirit might have left and Jesus sent him by. He said in death often, not once, not twice. Often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 strikes minus one. 39 times five. Wow. What do you call that? Lieutenant? Major? There is many, many strikes. The skin on his back was showing. Three times I was beaten with rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked a night and a day, soaked in seawater. How do you like that? I have been in the deep, deep, deep ocean. In journeys often. In perils of water. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. I tell you, Paul probably have a big poster there say, the most wanted man. <laughs> wilderness, city, everywhere he was wanted. They are alive. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. He don't even have enough food sometimes. He was not talking about just fasting the hunger. And then, besides the other things that comes, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Now just hold on for a moment and look there. 
While Paul was going through all these things he listed, he had the choice to come out. He didn't go through these things without a choice. If at any time he told God and he said, God, I cannot go anymore, I give up. He was a very educated man, brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, the best teacher of those days. He was recognized among the Sanhedrin. A Sanhedrin position means you have a religious authority and you have political power. Probably that will be Dato Dato. Political power in the Sanhedrin you carry. Added to that, he could earn his own living. He was an expert tent maker. He has a skill in secular work. Why did he give all these things just to do that, to preach the gospel? Paul says, because the love of God, he chose to humble himself. When you read here, Paul was naked, Paul was cold. That is the description of poverty. But there's a difference here. Here is not poverty caused by circumstances. Here was poverty out of free choice. Many people go without. Many people are in need because they couldn't help him. Paul could help him. Paul could have come out of it. He could have, he could have, could have all he needed. Stay comfortably in Tarsus. Teach other people Hebrew. He could have a good life, a comfortable life. But the difference was that Paul said, in the gist he said, actually he humbled himself. God called him. God sent him. He said, I am the servant of God. God tells me to go and bring the gospel there. I will go. He humbled himself. When he humbled himself, what happens when you humble yourself? God gives more grace. See? God gives more grace. That is a true humility. Yeah, he chose to humble himself. And here is a proof that he says in verse 29 and 30. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. I want you to know chapter 11 and chapter 12 is connected. He's talking about his infirmity. The sufferings he go through, not sufferings of the works of, the, of, of, of sicknesses or things like that, but suffering that result from him going from and preaching the gospel. Paul said all these things he found his lacking. He humbled himself. The pressures are great. Some of you thought that you are pressure. Wait till you go through this pressure. I mean this is remarkable pressure that a man could go through. A normal man go through just one, one tenth of that will die. What kept him alive? The grace of God. If the grace of God is on you, you can never die. Until you finish your work. Then you have to go home? Go home. Go home quickly. Don't delay. If you finish your work. I mean, I, I don't want to stay one moment longer if I finish my work. I just want to finish my work, go to be with Jesus. Best place. But there's tremendous work to do. Wouldn't want to stay one second longer if I finish my work. You say, God, take me home. Buy a coffee and already sit down and say, Bye, folks. Or maybe yet translated. That would be wonderful. Ask God, send a fiery chariot. Step on it. Bye. That would be wonderful. Paul says he's talking about his infirmities, the weaknesses in his life. And then he goes on to chapter 12. Same theme. Now, same theme. Don't let the chapters hinder you. It's all in the same book, same theme. It's the same letter. He says here, and you compare verse 30 in verse chapter 11. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. And then in verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure. Chapter 12, verse 10. I take pleasure in infirmity, in reproaches, in need, in persecution, in distresses. Now, this is a repeat of what he just repeated in chapter 11. 
See chapter 12, verse 10, he just summarized what he went through in chapter 11. I take pleasure in infirmity, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake, not for my own sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. Paul says he was weak. No human being can do the work he did. And what he did was not a human being's work. It was the Holy Spirit's grace imparted on a human vessel. How did he get a strength? When he humbled himself, he learned the lesson God says in the verse 9, chapter 12. My grace, look carefully in verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmity. Same thing, he's boasting in his infirmity. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. For God receives the proud and he gives grace to the humble. To the humble, he will give grace. So we see here, the Bible says, come humbly to the throne of God and obey God everything he asks you to do humility humble and when you're humble the spirit of glory will rest on you First Peter chapter 5 it talks about when you're reviled for Jesus' sake when you're suffering for Jesus the spirit of glory rests on, on you and there's the spirit of power because in Romans 6 verse 4 it says the glory of God raised Jesus up the glory of the Father raised Jesus up. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. So it's referring to the power of God. The resurrection power of God. The most powerful force released. When you're suffering for Jesus, when you're humbling yourself, God's glory comes upon you. God's grace comes upon you. And impart upon you. So let's be humble. Let's obey God in all He asks us to do. In your life, if you are persecuted, you judge, criticize, whatever happens in your life, check your heart in God. Don't repay evil with evil. When a dog barks at you, don't bark back, otherwise you become a dog. If a puppy barks at you and you give a, he say, wow, and you say, wow, and you succeed in driving the puppy away, you have just succeeded in becoming a bigger dog. No better. So that is why Jesus said, don't repay evil with evil. If someone did evil to you, you did evil back and you overcome, you have become a greater evil. Who is going to get rid of you? So the Bible says, not that way. But you keep doing good. You keep walking the christ right way. Keep walking in the things of Christ. And whenever you cannot stand it, I tell you there are circumstances. If you do the work of Christ, if you do the ministry of Christ, if you want to obey the Holy Spirit, you will be called strange. You be called a fanatic. You be called a heretic. You be called a false prophet. You be called a false this and a false that. You be called a troublemaker. You be called a church splitter. The Paul was called a church splitter in the Bible in the book of Acts. You read carefully. You call you be called all kinds of things. And you will suffer the words of men assassinating you. They shoot you down with words. And you suffer all these things. And you suffer misunderstanding. You suffer people avoid you. You suffer a lone ranger syndrome. All kinds of things you go through. And as to that, plus, you know, all kinds of difficulties that may come upon your life. All these things. And all the same time, there you are, patiently toiling away doing God's work. When you have no strength, draw from the Almighty. Draw down His grace upon your life. When the circumstances are beyond you, and you know that to walk Christ's way, you have to walk this way. The cross is before you. You could, by your own power, refuse the cross. But you know this is a way to walk the cross. When people slap you, you just pray for them. 
When people do things to you, just pray for them. No reaction, only love oozes out of you. Love flows up to your enemies. Love flows to all around. Then you are in a position to come before God and say, Father, cannot take it anymore. I ask grace. And you receive grace. Now grace, when you receive it, it comes in a certain way. And this is the most important part as we look at this part. When grace comes into your life, grace will have to work with faith. Grace will work with faith. It comes together. Turn with me in the Bible to the book of Romans chapter 4. Verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it may might be according to grace. You see how grace and faith are related. That it is of faith that it may be by grace. Then you turn to Romans chapter 6, or chapter 5. Verse 2. Through whom, that is through Jesus Christ, also we have access by faith. Everybody say faith. faith. Into this grace. Say grace. Faith. In which we stand. See, by faith into this grace. Faith and grace are interrelated. The book of Hebrews 13 says, Be established in grace. The same Greek word in Colossians 3 tells you, Be established and rooted in faith. Grace and faith are related. When Paul talks to the Galatians in the book of Galatians chapter 5, and he told them that you have fallen from grace, in Galatians 5, they have actually fallen from faith too. They are no more operating in faith. They were operating in works. And the whole book of Galatians emphasizes faith. Galatians chapter 5. Paul tells us in uh, verse 4, You have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. So he writes to them and he restores their faith. Faith and grace are related. Ephesians chapter 3. Paul writes here in verse 8. And here is where we are going to take the key and launch off on this section here. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, 9 and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Notice the word by grace through faith. By grace through faith. By grace through faith. And then not of yourself it is the gift of God. Not of works lest anyone should boast. Verse 10 For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice the difference in the two kinds of works. There is a type of works in verse 9 that Paul says not our works. Not our works. None of the works that you do in your own strength. Not by might, not by your own might, not by your own power, but by my spirit, Paul says. Not our own strength. Our own strength does not please him. Our own fleshly kind of ways does not please him. Our own intelligence will not please him. Our own works, human works will not please him. For all the human ability is as thinking dirt before him. Everything you can try to do, our own righteousness is as filthy rags. Paul says, none of these kind of works, none of the works of our own human souls. But he turns around in verse 10, Ephesians 2, and says, You are God's workmanship, created for, what's the word there? Good 
works. He's talking about different works now. You are created in God for good works. Isn't it marvelous? One verse in verse 9, he writes all works. The next verse in verse 10, he encouraged to work. What are we having here? What are we talking about here? Paul is talking a principle. Let me point to Ephesians here in uh, chapter 3, so you may understand. Pray God that you get this in your spirit. This is what Paul says in verse 7. He says, of which I, saying, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of His power. By the effective working of His power inside Him. Then remember 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. Let me quote it to you. Where Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. And I labor abundantly, yet not I, but the grace of God in my life labor. So let me put it this way again. You cannot do anything, not by might, not by power, not, not by anything of your human wisdom. If God did not put anything into you, you can never give anything out. If God did not give you the grace to be an apostle, you can never be. Try all you can. Study all the apostolic book you can. You can never. If God did not give you the grace, to be a teacher, you can never be. You see, you cannot go to a teacher's college training and come and say you're a teacher in the Bible ministry. You cannot. That is where Bible school can never give you those things. You can go to the best Bible schools, but if God did not call you to be an evangelist, no matter how you train to be one, you cannot. Now, Bible schools are good. We have a vision to start a Bible training center here. But the most important thing is that it must be the grace of God given into your life. Then we train you to operate the grace that you have. See the difference? We cannot give you what only God can give. Only God can give you grace. We cannot give you what God, only God can give. But what God has given you, we can help you and train you to operate. So that is where the Bible schools fail if they do not have a quality intake. If on the intake side, they do not discern whether God has a call on those people's lives, whether God has a certain ministry implanted, if we do not discern what God has given, we can never train the people out to do what they want. We cannot just lump everybody together and, and just put them under the same factory role and roll out the same thing, you know, just like factory producing. Then it's not God's method. For God has given gifts to the body of Christ. Five home ministries, different type of ministries, body ministries, all kinds of ministries are given, pour upon the body of Christ. And all of us need to discern the grace of God given to you. Be faithful to what God has given to you, and God will give you some more. If you are faithful as a teacher, God may promote you to a prophet. If you are faithful if as a deacon, God may promote you to an evangelist like he did Philip. See, discern the grace of God in your life. Unless God inputs into you, you cannot output. It's the law of God. So the works here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says, not works, not your own works, not those things that human beings try to do by themselves. These are rejected, rejected, rejected. God's quality control put the stand there, rejected. The only works acceptable are in verse 10. And this is how you receive and draw on that grace. See, it says here, we are created in Christ Jesus for His workmanship. He inputs certain things into our lives. And the whole context is talking in Ephesians chapter 2 about the grace of God. Look at verse 7. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace. How does God show His grace to all generations? This is how God shows His grace. Supposing that God were to give to this sister here uh, a grace to do something, then she fulfills it, then the world will see the grace of God in her life. And then God gives the grace of God to this brother here to do something, and he performs it, then we can see the grace of God in his life. So God wants to show to all generations, all people everywhere. He wants to show the new covenant people. He wants to show the New Testament covenant people. New Testament, not Old Testament. That the New Testament is run by grace. You are what you are not because you keep the Ten Commandments. 
You are what you are because of the grace of God. The New Testament is to show us God loves us so much. He gave His only begotten Son so that we can all be saved in Him. We are saved in Him. Now He sent us out for. He put something into us and we go out to the world and give out what He put into us. That's all. Nothing of ourselves. Everything of God. All we have to do, yield our spirit, souls and bodies for all that God wants us to do in our lives. Doesn't matter whether it's public or private. I mean, in my, in my life, I desire to just, just be as quiet as possible in one corner and God wants me to. I'll be happy. I show God that. I only want what is His will. I don't want anything else but His will for me. And all of us should have that desire. Only His will and not our will. And here is how in all ages, in all generations, we all are going to see the grace of God. If the whole body of Christ throughout the whole world, Five billion people in the world, maybe about one billion or about two billion or 1.5 billion people are believers. All these faithful people, every Christian, every believer in Christ, every believer in the whole church, the universal church, the one church, and I believe there's only one church, the one church is the church of Jesus Christ in the whole wide world. Every believer will be obedient to God to do what God wants them to do of the grace of God. The world will look and see the grace of God. In all aspects, everywhere they go, they'll see the grace of God. So that is how, in verse 7, the grace of God will be manifest through all ages. Through our lives. And it's connected to verse 10. Paul says that God has given each one of us some kind of work. Every one of us has received grace to do some work. Grace to perform some things. Don't try to do what the Spirit of God did not ask you to do because you will not have the grace of God to do so. But what the Spirit of God has given unto you, do it forth. Bring it forth. And it's very different. Here it says, God has given those works to do and you just go out and it says in verse 10, chapter 2 verse 10, you just walk in those works. That is why Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If your yoke is not easy and your burden is not is heavy, it cannot be Jesus' yoke because Jesus' yoke says it's easy and it is light. And if you go on your own strength to do something good intentions, you will have a very heavy yoke, you'll feel the burden, feel the pressure. You cannot stand it because you don't have the grace of God to stand the pressure. But when you have the grace of God in your life to do what God tells you to do, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, you see the works of God, all that God wants you to do, you just go out and you just walk in them. He says in verse 10, just walk in them. Walk in the works of God. It's the easiest thing to do the, the things of God. Just walk in them. Just yield and walk. That's all. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. There's another version, a paraphrased version that says, not by sweat, not by blood, but by His Spirit. By His Spirit, not by our own, own ways. That God will help us to do those things. And I want to help you to discover how that grace operates. See, the grace of God in verse 10, you humble yourself, you draw the grace of God, it comes upon you. Grace will help you to be faith. Grace and faith work together. Faith in Hebrews 11 verse 1 is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Evidence means you see something, they are evidence of the future. You receive revelations of the future. You receive, right now, evidence of the future. Substance is a solid substance. Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith. Faith and grace operate together. Here's how it operates. Say in uh, verse 8, it talks about grace and faith. Grace operating, faith operating. God will show you what He wants you to do. By His grace, you draw on it by faith and grace operating together. You receive all those things and you go out and you do them. Now let me check on your line. If God were to show you very clearly that He wants you to go out and raise 10 people from the dead. You, 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 you know it. God wants you to do it. And God has even told you their names, where they are, 
where the funeral services are. Right? Ten people from the day. God sometimes says those kinds of things. Remember Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 10, go and raise the dead. Wow, what a commandment. I think if, if Jesus was stand here and say, go and raise the dead, half of us will faint. But supposing God wants you to do that, and you know for sure that God wants you to do that. Let's say Christina. God tells you to go and raise the dead. Ten people tells you the name, tells you everything. You're really sure that God wants you to do that. Would that be very easy? Eh? Give a big nod. <laughs> right. Very easy. But the only problem is if you're not sure. See the difference? It's in your conviction, you're being sure of what God tells you to do. If, if she's there, she's not sure. Maybe this is me, maybe this is not God. Maybe this is maybe maybe this is my idea. Maybe I read too much. So she's not sure. The moment she's not sure, it's gonna be very hard to do the work. See the difference in the ease and the difficulty is in our knowing. Our knowing what God wants us to do. If God tells me to raise ten people on the day, he tells me very clearly I know it is, then I go just raise no problem. You go there and knock, tick, tick, wake up, tick, tick, wake up, tick, tick, wake up. You want to go there, oh God, God, God. By the time you finish trying to raise one and they probably be more dead, you got no voice for the others. All because they're not sure. So the most important thing is to be sure, to receive from God what God wants you to do. Let's study the life of Jesus, how the grace of God operates on His life. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John. And Jesus said, marvelous statement, John chapter 5. Gospel of John chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself and you can re- put your name there that you as a branch cannot do anything without the vine just as Jesus is to the father we are to Jesus to the Holy Spirit the son can do nothing of himself and the branch can do nothing without the vine what he sees the father do for whatever he does the son also does in like manner for the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself does and He was showing greater works. See, He has to do His miracles, His works. Then these that you may marvel. And the context is that Jesus Christ had raised a paralyzed man. He just did a work of God. He just wrought a miracle. And everybody was angry with him because he did it on the Sabbath day. What a funny reason to be angry. Oh, because he did it on the Sabbath day. And Jesus explained to them, What the Father shows me, I just go and do that. That's all. Father shows me, I just go and perform. So, he received the grace of God to perform a task. He received the grace of God. And then he go out and do the work. The same way you and I will function in. As you walk in God. As you meditate on God's word. Don't rush ahead of God if God never tells you to do anything. Meditate on God's word. Stay in God's presence. We have one tape on standing in the presence of God. On moving and anointing. It's important to learn to stay in the presence of God. Remember when Elijah, Elisha, they always said, I stand in the presence of God. All the angels, Gabriel, they, when they come, they sometimes say, we are, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. See, they are constantly standing in the presence of God and worshipping. Don't do anything God didn't ask you to do. But just stand in God's presence, worship Him, minister to Him, meditate on the Word, grow spiritually, wait on Him, entwine yourself with Him. Oh, draw strength and grace from Him. Then when you draw it down, you go and just walk in them. There's no struggle. Just go and walk in them. Jesus never struggled for any healing and miracles. He just walked in them. He just walked in them. Because the Father shows him. Sometimes the Father will show you through the inward witness. Sometimes the Father will show you through vision. Many times, before meetings, God will show me the things that He wants to do. I just go and just do them. That's all. Very simple. You just have to receive from Him. Draw from Him. The grace of God. 
You just listen to God. He will show you. Sometimes He will show that you have to minister to a certain place and you go. Then you just obey Him. Let's all walk in Him. Walk in Him. Walk in Him. And so that brings us to the most important point in grace. That's the final point as we conclude. That grace is always in the present tense. I can show you hundreds of scriptures. I'll just show you a few. It's in the past tense, but in the present tense, never in the future tense. Always in the present tense. At least it's past and present tense. Let me show you how, how it works here. John chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 tells us that of Him we have received, of His fullness we have all received, John chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Of His fullness we have all received, we have all received grace for grace, which is grace upon grace. Right? Of His fullness. Now, what tense is that? Is that past tense? Anybody has a future tense in your Bible? Past tense in the Greek. I read Greek, I study Greek. It's past tense. Past tense. It's past tense and also present tense because it's actual now. We have all received grace upon grace. It's always something in the past and in your present experience. That's an important point for you to understand grace, operate in grace. Turn with me to another interesting scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. Let me, let, and we will show how to draw on that. See, all grace has to do with Jesus Christ. Jesus is full of grace and truth. And of Him we have received His fullness, grace upon grace. Jesus is full of grace. If you want to know where to draw grace, draw from Jesus. His throne of grace. Jesus is full of grace. And remember, He talks about the riches of His grace. Now we turn to 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. Just keep your hand there. Jesus is full of the riches of His grace. All grace comes through Jesus. Every passage in the New Testament that talks about grace points back to the work of Jesus. Remarkable. It points back to what Jesus has done. God says, now how is God able to give you grace? Based on what Jesus has done. Study all the book of Romans, the whole book of Romans. All the grace is based on the works of Jesus. He became sin. He took our sin. Jesus took our poverty. Jesus took all those things that hinder us from God's glory and life coming into us. Adam lost the fellowship with God. God restored it and gave His life and grace so that we can do work. His works, not our own works. For the judge shall live by His faith. In the book of Habakkuk. His faith, His grace in our life. So grace is always based on the works of Jesus, all that Jesus has done. And in His mercy, even the fivefold ministries, Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12, say that Him who descended is Him who also ascended. And when He ascended, He gave gifts to men. Have you read that? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. And to some He gave apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. See, when he ascended, he gave gifts. Now, the gifts of the Bible ministry are based on the ascension of Jesus, based on the works of Jesus, based on the accomplishment of Jesus. And we can show you if we have time and if we ever have a seminar on teaching on the Bible ministry that Jesus was an apostle, Jesus was a prophet, Jesus was an evangelist, Jesus was a pastor, Jesus was a teacher. So when he was resurrected from the dead, he just gave part of his ministry to all of us. See, the grace came from him. Came from him. All grace comes from Jesus. And all the ministry gifts of the Spirit, all the manifestations of the Spirit, the night gifts of the Spirit, all come because of Jesus. Read Galatians 3 verse 13, verse 14 in fact that tells us, Verse 14 says, That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. That we, Galatians 3 verse 14, might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's the gift of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit working. 
the revelation gifts, the power gifts, and the worker gifts. See, all the work of the Holy Spirit is based on the ascension of Jesus and pouring His Spirit upon us. In the last days, God will pour His Spirit all over. All over. And then His gifts operate. Some will see visions, some dream dreams. Visions and prophecies will come forth. The gifts of the Spirit will operate based on what Jesus has done. Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go. John 14 verse 12 Jesus said most assuredly I say to you he who believes in me the works that I do he will do and greater works than this he will do because I go to my father that cross said because I go to my father he explained he took three chapters to explain chapter 14, 15 and 16 of John to explain that he's going up is in order to send the Holy Spirit that we can have his grace and work his work See, all the, all the things you have, all, everything is based on what Jesus Christ has done. For only in Christ you can have grace. Outside of Christ, no grace. Grace is only found in Jesus Christ. And if you read Galatians 3 verse 14, where it says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Spirit through faith is based on verse 13, which says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, having been made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Then verse 14, that, the word that connects the two verses, that the blessing of Abraham. And what is the blessing of Abraham? It covers the coming of the Spirit of God in verse 14. See, all the gifts of the Spirit, everything that the Spirit of God do, everything, all your character, the fruit of the Spirit, everything comes through grace, comes through Jesus. Everything. Everything. And when it comes to you, you must, this is important, you must see it, receive it, before you go out. You have to receive before you go. If you want to be an evangelist, if God calls you to be one, you must receive the grace, then you go and perform. It must be a present tense experience for you. A past tense and a present tense. God may call you to be an evangelist, but you don't have the grace to, in, to fulfill it yet. Don't go yet. You have to wait upon God. You may just be an ordinary believer. Wait upon God's timing. If the grace has not dropped into your life, don't do it yet. You don't have the power to sustain in the pressure that will come. So it's important to see that if it's future tense, you cannot do it. Grace is always past tense and present tense. If future tense, you better wait upon God. God called Paul to be an apostle, but for 10 years he didn't fulfill the ministry. 10 years, Acts chapter 9, God appeared to Ananias and told Ananias, I have chosen him. He is a chosen vessel to go before Gentiles and kings to bear my name. In other words, God is telling Ananias, he is called to be an apostle. God told Paul that, Paul told in his testimony in Acts chapter 26, that he was called, chosen of God to be an apostle. He knew it himself. But for 10 years, he could not be an apostle because the grace of God did not come upon him yet. It's the future. You cannot go on future tense, grace. You must have a past tense and a present tense experience of grace. And so... He waited. Acts chapter 9, he was converted. That's about AD 35. Acts 45. In the church of Antioch. Acts chapter 13. That is AD 45. No Acts 45. So we have, in Acts 13, in verse 1 to 3, that they were praying together. The leaders in the church of Antioch. And the Holy Spirit spoke in verse 2. Separate me, Paul and Barnabas. Verse 3, they laid hands on, he, on them and sent both of them out. Then he began his apostolic ministry. Ten years later. AD 35 to AD 45. Ten years. Before that, in Acts 11, Paul was a teacher. By Acts 11, he was a teacher. He taught with Barnabas in the church at Antioch. Have you noticed that you cannot produce what God did not put into you? And if God calls you to be an apostle, the grace of God has not come on your life for that area. It's still future tense. Don't do it. You must have it in past and present tense. There are different phases of ministry. 
So to receive the grace of God, you must receive it as a past tense experience and a present tense. By now, do you all have 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9? If you have it, say Amen. Right. So, let me show how to receive the grace of God. It will bless you. It will bless you. Bless you through and through. The grace of God. Remember, we have covered in our second message on grace, that we have grace for prosperity, grace for power, grace for different areas. Just want to show all those things. Remember, I talked about Acts chapter 4, great power was demonstrated and great grace was demonstrated. So, grace will produce all those things in your life. How to receive grace? Let's look at an example in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Just illustrate with prosperity. That's an area you can understand and identify with. If I use ministry gifts, not all you will understand. So, we try to use something that you will understand. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. For you know what's the word? Grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though He was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And we have shown how in, uh, in chapter 9 of St. Corinthians, verse 8, when you have abundant grace, you have abundant prosperity. Grace is proportionate, the prosperity is proportional to the grace of God on your life. You prosper not because of your smartness, you prosper because of your obedience. You prosper not because of your skill, you prosper because of your obedience. And God gives grace. So here is prosperity. Notice what tense is it? Past tense. Saint Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. What tense is that? Shout it out. Past tense. So it's in the past tense. It happened when Jesus was on the cross. There was one time he was completely stripped of everything. He became poor. And that you may receive His grace for prosperity. See, grace is tangible. This is how you do it. When you meditate on these words, you draw on grace and prosperity. As you come and humble yourself before God, let God lay His hands on you and receive grace and prosperity. And when you receive grace for prosperity, before long you will prosper in the natural. When you receive it, you will prosper outwardly. And when you receive grace for prosperity, it's, and it's, the, it's the way to prosper, not just by your works. When you confess prosperity scriptures to get into prosperity, it is not because you uh, of your cleverness in confession that you got it but your confession helped you to realize what has already been bought for you that's how it operates your confession helps you to realize and manifest and gain knowledge of what has already been yours in Christ everything in grace must be past tense you must see in Christ Christ has done it for you I am not going to be rich I shall not be rich but it says in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 I have become past perfect tense sounds like English class here past perfect tense but there is where people stumble people fall because of their tenses and their tenses you keep believing God God is going to heal going to heal going to heal you die you believe that by His flesh you are healed then you have a chance See, your tenses can kill you. Because if you believe in the future, it's not faith, it's hope. It's hope. Faith is in the present tense. Bring it into the present reality. So by grace you receive. By grace you receive. And what do you do? You begin to see prosperity in your life. You draw grace. Let God's grace speak unto you. What area of prosperity God wants you to experience he began to go into that area. And then he put a little word of caution here. Because some people will take this scripture and run off to one corner. And be very selfish and covetous about everything they do. Right? Prosper, prosper, prosper. Rich, 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 rich. No? Have a Rolls Royce outside in your car park. Have a 200 bedroom house when you need only three. 
Some people have a misconception. They are not talking about prosperity, they are talking, talking about covetousness. Now let me just put this forward to you. I believe that we must take care to be an example in every area of our life. If something you have or you do may stumble another person that you can do away with, do away with it. And it's my advice, if you are called to the ministry, and I talk this over with some ministers that come, I say, this is what I believe God is speaking today. If you are a minister of God, you must live your lifestyle not so high that people can, cannot reach you. Neither must you turn it the opposite way and try to be very humble, and live so low, purposely wear tattered torn clothing, wear shoes with a crocodile mouth, Say that as well, holy and pure. Holy and poverty doesn't go that way. Sometimes you're holy, H O L E L Y. When the Bible says H O L Y, you got your spelling mixed up. Go back and learn that uh, Webster's dictionary. So you got it all mixed up. I believe if you have a call of God in your life, you must leave about the average. Holy. God may bless you, you can afford more, but you must not for the gospel's sake. Uh, <clears throat> you must not for the gospel's sake. Many people have stumbled, and God has shown me the revelation on this area, that it's important. Now you cannot live so low, you cannot reach the rich. You cannot live so high, you cannot reach the poor. You have to live a lifestyle about average. And average is not Rolls Royce. Are you hearing me? Very few are men. On the other hand, some of you in the business line may be required to live a certain lifestyle to reach certain clientele. I realize and I acknowledge there are certain areas of business where you are reaching to certain group of people and your clientele. I mean your clients are in the category. And God bless you, you can afford that. You, you are not in the ministry. By all means, go ahead. I am only speaking about the ministry. And I give you a scripture for that. Jesus Christ could afford a mansion when he was born. Jesus was the only one who could choose where he was to be born. But he chose to be born in a manger. Why? Not because he couldn't afford, but because he wanted an example. And if you're called to the ministry, not only is your word to be blessing people, your lifestyle has to be an example to people. Amen? So we have to realize that each culture is different. Now, and that is why in our church, we reach a certain point where we believe it's average. And uh, we, we wear ties, but I don't wear a three-piece suit. Because the common people don't wear three-piece suit. I mean the business people, the average people just wear a tie. So we go on the average. You say, how about going tieless? Sometimes you cannot reach to those people who wear ties. So we wear just about the average. But if I am staying in another country where it's normal for the people to wear coats, I have no choice but to, to, to do some, to, to wear, I don't have to wear a thousand piece, three piece suit, thousand dollar three piece suit, but you wear average cost and you, so that you reach, because if some people look at you, they don't want to hear you, then you have lost everything. Your main part is to reach out to people, to reach out to people. So your example, Paul, I give you another scripture, Paul says, that I am all things to all men, that I may win all to Jesus Christ. So if you have a call of God in your life, don't keep dreaming of a Mercedes Benz, Rolls Royce, BMW. Please, you must discern to live the average lifestyle. If I am staying in the village right now, if it, this is not Kuala Lumpur, if the whole church right now is in some far away town, average, we probably go without ties. I want you to know that. We have to go about the average so that we can reach all class, all groups. If it's in a village where nobody wears ties, and then you go there, drive your Rolls Royce there, wear your ties, three thick coats, the poor will never come to the church. Right. Anyway, I just throw that in. I feel I have to do that in case some people take this and go outside. And some of you, if you can afford more, you must think and pray about your example. 